You're listening to another life-transforming message from C3 Church San Diego. For more information on our church, go to c3sandiego.com. So we are in our God in Hollywood series, and I'm excited about it because I've been wanting to, to preach a message to strengthen our marriages for a little while. So this was my opportunity. I was just waiting for the right movie. So on the way home from Israel, yes, it deserves your woos. I'll drink to that. I'm also very jet lagged, so let's just add that to the equation. I was up at 2.30, so I'm telling the truth like I'm doubling down on the truth. So when I'm tired, I lose my spit and polish. Like other times I'd be like, how can I sugarcoat this? So this is, this is, you're getting like raw beef today. Like I'm, I'm not even cooking it. I'm, I'm not putting any salt on it. Like there's a T-bone, eat it raw. So that's today's message. So I was watching a movie on the way home called Aftermath, The Aftermath. And the whole story was, it was really two similar stories playing out side by side. The story was Germany was trying to rebuild itself after World War II. So they were wanting to completely distance themselves from, uh, you know, the Nazi party and rebuild a beautiful, new, righteous Germany. And... English troops had come in to help this happen to the the city of Hamburg. And playing side by side is is the reset of Germany as well uh, after, you know, it had been reduced to, you know, just completely bombed out and starving inhabitants and just a terrible reputation. Side by side, we see a couple. He was in the British military and he was sent over to help rebuild. They're having to put their marriage back together. There'd been a whole lot of stuff stuff that had gone on. Um, Their son had died in a bomb raid in England. They'd lost their only son. He blamed her for the death. He distanced himself from her. She's trying to process the grief, but he would isolate. He wouldn't speak to her. So there was a huge wedge between them. When they moved to Germany, the woman, Rachel, ends up having an affair with a very handsome German. And all I'm saying is you've got to be careful of very handsome Germans. I'm married to one. (laughs) So I know. Um, so she ends up having an affair and she has this connection with him. And, and then it gets to the point where she's like, I'm going to run away with him. I, I've never fe- I haven't felt this way for a really long time. My husband and I are completely disconnected. And she's about to run away with him. And then this happens. So we're going to cut to the scene where she's about to get on a train and start a new life with a new man. A comment in the movie, it's a German word called Stund. Null, which means zero hour. In other words, at zero hour, everything can start fresh. And listen, I, I know that there are people in this room and, you know, you've, you've been married before and you're married again. I'm not talking about going back. I'm talking about loving the one you're with, who you're with right now. So I just want to make a clarification on that. Um, I realise... I realise that not everybody had... A fairy tale ending, but but I want to speak to who you're who are you married to today? <laughs> Let's make this work because I truly believe, even though there was a whole lot of history and a whole lot of baggage and abuse and betrayal and neglect and a whole lot of things that happened in this marriage, when you have two people that are a hundred percent committed to making the marriage work, you have a hundred percent chance of succeeding. Yeah. This story and many stories that I've heard in church have shown me that you can have a really messed up background, but if you make a decision, I'm going to stay the course and I'm going to reset, God can make something beautiful out of something that may have been really, really ugly. So I want to talk about it today and I want to talk about it very honestly and I want to be really real because I know our problems are real. You know, Pastor Matt was uh, quoting a statistic in the first service that we're now in an an era and a stage where 70% of marriages are ending in divorce. So I feel like when the church is silent on those issues, it actually gives the enemy a foothold. So I want to talk about some stuff because watching that movie, in many parts of it, it felt like a really arduous and bad pastoral care, care appointment. And... Like, they did everything wrong. 
But praise God at the end, they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to work it out. It takes two willing, committed people to make it work. But I, I got to thinking about what kind of care they'd need to move forward and move forward well. They'd need some really good pastors. They'd need some really honest pastors that would help them reset what needed to be reset. So today I want to I wanna talk very real and open and honest, honestly with you today because I've asked myself the question and maybe you have, why do some marriages last and some don't? And I think um, it's because some people don't want to put the work in. And the truth is marriages, the idea of marriage is made in heaven, but the hard work is done on earth. And many times we want to hand back to God the responsibility and say, well, I'll just go out on the cherished altar call and I'll cry and I'll, I'll ask people to pray for my marriage. And listen, we're, we're going to pray for your marriage. But at the end of the day, God has given us our relationships to steward. He's given us the responsibility to make the most out of what he's put in our hands. So today I want to give you 10 very real and very honest points on how we can reset our marriage. It is possible. You can have a new beginning. You can have a stund null, a zero hour of your very, very own. I want to start by reading you a scripture. It's found in the book of James, chapter number two, verses 14 to 17. And you'll, you'll have heard this one before. It says this, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, dear husbands and wives, if you say that you have faith, if you pray for your marriage, but you don't show it by your actions. Can that kind of faith, can those prayers save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith, hoping for something by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So I got this scripture and I changed it around. I did the Leanne version and I got one for the boys and one for the girls. So you ready? All right. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you want a great marriage, but you don't show it by your actions? Can wanting it alone save it? Suppose you have a wife, men, who needs to know that you love her and you say, I love you, but then you don't make time for her. No stolen moments in a busy week that show her, even though your week is completely full, she is your priority. She can't remember the last time you bought her flowers just because. You don't tell her her beauty takes your breath away or take her shopping and spend money on her and reassure her that her butt does not look fat in that. <laughs> you don't hold her hand on the couch and pretend to love that movie she loves because it's not your preference. The thought of watching Rose not share the door as Jack freezes in the ocean again <laughs> makes you die a little on the inside. So you see, wanting it isn't enough. Unless your desire produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. All right, you ready, ladies? It's your turn. <laughs> what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you want a happy marriage and you go down on the cherished old call and you cry and there's tissues <laughs> and Pam comes and she delivers you from a demon, <laughs> but you don't show it by your actions? Can wanting alone save it, ladies? Suppose you have a husband who has a desire to know that he is valued by you and you say, I value you. And you post Instagram saying, oh, hashtag dreamy. <laughs> but you haven't made love for him, to him for weeks. Da -da -da. The first clanger because you're tired, uh, or you have a headache, uh, or you've got too much on your mind, uh, <laughs> or you're mad at him. Uh, and even though you promised, tomorrow night, my darling, tomorrow never comes. <laughs> because when he gets to bed, you're already asleep in something that resembles your Amish grandmother's nightgown. 
You resent him when he's watching the sports game and so you vacuum and clean up noisily. <laughs> letting him know that while he's relaxing, that you are slaving away like a bitter Cinderella. <laughs> and if he should ever dare to do something without you, like a night out with the boys or a weekend away, you use it to lord over him with guilt for weeks. So you see, my lady friends, wanting it isn't enough unless your desire produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Amen, Leanne. Everything can change. It's time to reset. So are you ready for the 10 points? I'm going to move fast. All right, I'm just going to throw this raw meat out there. You've got to pick it up, okay? <laughs> Number one, we've got to be understanding. See, women and men, we process differently. And if you watch this movie and disclaimer, it's R-rated. And actually, this message is probably R-rated too. So if you have kiddos in here, just be forewarned. Um, I, I, the men and women process differently. And we'd be foolish to try to get the other person to change. Rather, we need to be a little bit flexible and understand, I want you to have grace for me because I process differently than you, but I'm also going to extend grace to you. So here's what Peter says to the men in his day. He said, in the same way, you husbands, you give honour to your wives. How do you honour her? Treat her with understanding as you live together. Hmm. Why do wives need understanding? Because sometimes they're going to be really hard to understand. It's not complicated. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. And I love this, because God's not a deadbeat dad, and he loves his girls. He's like, if you don't treat my daughter well, talk to the hand, because the face ain't listening. <laughs> so you got to remember that right there, guys. Now, now, you might pipe off and go, oh my gosh, there's so many scriptures in the Proverbs. Solomon wrote about a nagging wife being like a dripping tap. To start with, he had way too many wives. <laughs> way too many. I'm not here to judge, but all you need is one. Way too many wives. But what I love is what he wrote. He kind of tells on himself in his own proverb, in Proverbs 27, 15 to 16. A nagging spouse is like the drip, drip of a leaky faucet. You can't turn it off and you can't get away from it. Exactly, Solomon, exactly. You cannot get away from it. So men, what's the lesson? Listen the first time. Listen the first freaking time. Is she nagging or is she frustrated? There is nothing more torturous to a woman than not being able to express herself. And just in case you think your wife is the only one, every woman processes verbally. They have to. It's like we'll explode if we don't talk. We have to talk. And when you run away, when we're like, you will make it worse, just so you know. We will hunt you down. We will chase you. It will not end well for you. You're better just to listen the first time. Men and women process differently. Don't try to turn her into a man. You married her because she's not a man. Why don't you act like me? You can thank God she doesn't act like you because you wouldn't have wanted her in the first place if she did. All right. What else do I want to tell you? Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to talk to the girls now. That's enough for the men that you want right at this moment. Women, don't overdo it. You've you got to be like Kenny Rogers. You've got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Okay, there's a line. There's a line. And I'm telling you, when you cross that thing, when you cross that thing enough, you will create a reputation for yourself that is really hard to undo. So, so, girls, we've got to understand the, the appropriateness and the wisdom in timing. See, sometimes we're just like, well, I need to say it, and it needs to be said now, and we need to get it dealt with until both our eyeballs are bugged out and the sun is coming up and the rooster is crowing. No. Have some wisdom. Here's the difference between you and a man. You like to process verbally. You like to process with him. He likes to process alone. You know how I know this? 
Do you know that Adam never asked for Eve? <laughs> he didn't go, geez, God, I'd really love a companion. <laughs> someone just like me, but a little more feminine, detail-oriented, someone to iron my fig leaves. He never said that. <laughs> he didn't. Not once did he say that, okay? God God like pulled a whammy on him while he was asleep. He woke up and she was there. He never even asked for her. It was God who said, um, it's not good for man to be alone. I gotta do something about this situation. But you'll find ladies that your man will go off and he'll process like he did in the beginning with the Lord. And listen, if he's not talking, don't think that he's not thinking about it. And oftentimes we can think, well, he's not talking. He, he can't possibly. No, he's thinking about it. Men process in their heads. They process alone. Us girls, we have to process. But so that's why we've got to be people who dwell with one another with understanding. Great. You give me grace, I'm going to give you grace. We're going to be understanding. There is a time and a place for conversations. Time and a place. Us girls have to understand that everything doesn't have to be dealt with just at that moment. And I was teaching our cherished girls this year in the story of Esther, how Esther was able to have such influence because she had wisdom about when to speak and when not to. Her predecessor, Queen Vashti, lost her place of influence and was banished because she didn't know when to keep her mouth shut. She didn't have the right conversations at the right time. And a lot of us girls have been unseated from places of influence because we haven't understood the importance of timing having the right conversation at the right time. And so we've been banished, but Esther was smart. She took three days to have the conversation. Three days, she waited till the time was right. She cooked that man a meal. She prepared a party for him. And then she came in with her request and oh my gosh, it was, he, he was like ready to eat out of her hand. Whatever you want, my darling, up to half my kingdom. <sighs> Funny you ask that. <laughs> Be understanding. Point number two, be kind. You know, I wonder if it grieves you like it grieves me how you hear spouses talk about each other or to each other sometimes. Ah, I, I think it's so wicked. I think there are two words that shouldn't go together and they are domestic and abuse. <coughs> Verbal abuse. And yet a lot of us in our marriage relationships will be so cavalier with words but what I've found is unkind words lead to unkind acts. So we have to be really careful about how we speak to our spouse. It's going to be tempting because you're in this close proximity and it's like that iron sharpening iron that the Bible talks, us about, talks about. So there's a whole lot of sparks and you're want to, going to want to label her according to her behaviour. You're going to want to label him according to his behaviour. I remember right in our early years of marriage and our not so early years of marriage, I would, man, I could get mad. I knew how to get mad. I am woman, hear me roar. And my husband, whenever I'd get crazy, would call me a psycho. You're a psycho. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, nothing made me more psycho than being called a psycho. <laughs> You're a psycho. I'm like, oh. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to a whole nother level. And here's the thing. God set it up in the beginning when he told Adam to name the animals. He said, they will become what you call them. So our spouses are going to live down to our words. Or they can live up to our words. Now, listen, being kind doesn't mean we lack honesty and we're not truthful. And we don't have the right conversations. Here's how it should have been said, Leanne, this isn't like you. You're not behaving like yourself. You need to stop it. But calling somebody a psycho, the B word, ain't going to help nothing. It's going to be a stain on their soul and you'll find that they'll behave down to those words instead of living up to who they truly are. Remind them of who they truly are. Proverbs 12, 18 says this, reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, I know just what to say to trigger my husband. But when you use somebody's vulnerabilities and insecurities to hurt them, that makes you a bully. Be kind. Point number three, create an environment of security. 
You know, I really love and want to honour my husband today. He travels a lot and we're around a lot of people all the time. He's around a lot of women, a lot of beautiful women. But he has never once in our entire marriage given me any reason to not do anything but implicitly trust him. And let me tell you, that's something that we have to be intentional about. We have to have really good boundaries, especially as it relates to the opposite sex. Now, that doesn't mean we pander to ridiculous insecurities. Who were you? Why were you talking to that other woman? No, chill out. Like it's in those moments, reassure them, honey, listen, you don't need to feel insecure. I want to reassure you. I don't want anyone else but you. I don't want anyone. You'd be smart to actually take a minute to hear their insecurities and their vulnerabilities and use it as an opportunity to reassure them. Reassure them. Don't tell them they're being stupid. Reassure them. You don't need to worry. But men, be smart. Be smart. Let me give you a little uh, little example here. (laughs) Don't have a long, drawn-out conversation with the woman in the string bikini at the beach with her boobs hanging out that looks like she fell off the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine. There is no wife in the world that is not going to be racked with insecurity as she sits there on the sand surrounded by snotty toddlers and goldfish crumbs and juice boxes in her one piece to cover her stretch marks. She will want to scratch your eyes out. Be smart, America. Be smart. Girls. When that trim, fit, and muscular guy comes on the screen of the television, remember, your man thinks he looks like that even if he doesn't. (laughs) He's like, is this TV screen a mirror? (laughs) So, don't destroy his fantasy of himself by saying, I wish you had a body like that. He thinks he does. And he will be shattered to think you don't think he does. You know, men, men's egos are fragile. They don't need to hear about your latest boy crush, your man crush. I will never do that. It sounds so juvenile to start with. If you're over 18 and you're still doing that, stop it. But also it just sows little seeds. Just, just be really careful. Know where the boundaries are. Point number four. Every woman's love language, every woman's, is quality time. She's going to have a bunch of others too, but that one is like a a for sure. That's right in there. It's not just your wife, it's all wives. And here's the way that God set it up. Genesis 3.16. He said, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. What does that mean? God made women just a little bit needy. She wants to be with you. Even if you're just sitting there doing nothing and you're holding hands, watching TV, she wants to be with you. And guys, I want to let you in behind the curtain. When you have a choice to spend time with her or do something else, and she says to you, oh, I don't care. (laughs) You can do whatever you want. I don't care. Look at me. She cares. She cares. And if you don't choose her, she will judge you and there will be repercussions. I just, I'm helping you out here. It's time for the reset. Now, just like every woman's love language is quality time, every man, point number five, wants to be respected. Ooh, it's the key to his heart. Do you respect me? And do you know how men spell respect? appreciation. Do you appreciate what I do for you? See, we have a a blight. It is a real problem in the world today. It's called entitlement. And, And as women, we need to have some expectations, of course, in marriage, just as men do of us. We need to have them of them. You should expect that he's going to provide and make money to pay the bills and look after the family and that he's going to protect you and that He's going to be faithful to you. These are all really healthy things. But expectation becomes a problem when it switches over from expectation, healthy expectation from a healthy woman who has a healthy self-esteem to entitlement. Do you know what entitlement is? Expectation without gratitude. Well, you should. Yeah, yeah, it's my birthday. You should have got me that Gucci purse. Yeah. 
Don't expect me to say thank you because you should. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Uh, stop that. He wants you to, he wants to know, do you know what it costs me to get up early in the morning with the sweat on my brow, do what I do, make sure I'm fit, I'm working out at the gym, I'm taking care of business deals, I'm taking advantage of that opportunity and this opportunity so I can take you on vacation, so I can make sure you don't have to worry, so I can make sure you can stay home and raise the kids if you don't want to work. And you're just like, yeah. (laughs) Well, you should. (laughs) If you don't appreciate anything, you won't understand the value of what you have. And you won't understand the value until it walks out the door and is in the hands of someone who does. Ooh, yeah, write that down. (laughs) So another movie, not to kind of like double dip in the movies, but one of them that I really love is Bridget Jones' Diary. And there's a scene in Bridget Jones' diary where somehow through a hilarious series of events she ends up in a Thai prison and she's surrounded by very dysfunctional, broken women. And it's a comedy movie and they're all sharing their stories and she's talking about how her, her bad boyfriend broke her heart and Mr Darcy, he broke my heart. And um, anyway... The, all the Thai women, these other prisoners, are sharing their stories. You know, yeah, my boyfriend, he beat me and he make me take drug. Oh, my boyfriend, he cheat on me and he steal all my money. And they turn to Bridget and she says, and they say to her, Bridget, what did your bad boyfriend do? And Bridget goes, well, he didn't stick up for me at the lawyer's supper and he doesn't fold the towels properly. And then all of a sudden, you just see her eyes open wide and big. And then in a voiceover, her her voice speaking, she goes, Oh, Bridget, you've been an utter fool. And I actually think that's plenty of the women in America today. We don't understand what neglect is. We don't understand what a problem is. Uh, Where did you get me? Uh, Why are you taking me here? Uh, I don't like this car. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Don't be a diva. Appreciate what you got. You can still have a really great self-esteem and and have a level of expectation in life without being a brat who doesn't appreciate anything. My gosh. What does the Bible say? Let's talk about that. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything, give thanks, for this is in the, the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God is willing that you appreciate my gosh, men come alive when, when they're appreciated. They'll climb mountains for you. They'll slay dragons for you. They'll stay up burning the midnight oil to close that deal for you. But when you don't appreciate it, when you expect it, oh my God. All right, that's enough on that. Point number six, keep the passion alive. This is, this is important, my friends, because I wonder if the amount of marriages that have broken up and tensions uh, that we see in marriages and the 70% divorce rate are because we put passion and energy into everything except each other. And can we not diminish the importance of sexual intimacy? And I know people don't like to talk about this and, oh, what are you talking about this at church? And woman and her dress is too short and why is she... Listen... <laughs> Stop it, all right? That's how Jesus made me. I'm I'm just saying, like, some of y'all out there, you got a problem here and nobody else is talking about it, so I'm going to talk about it, all right? Because I feel like someone should. And I'm not going to preach this at Colour Conference or Hillsong or anything. Don't worry about it. But this is like a, this is what a mother needs to do. Doesn't the Bible say that the older women, regardless of whether they still look fabulous, should train the younger women? Yes. Has anybody told you it is going to be a wedge in your relationship if you don't get the sex thing right, the intimacy thing right? And I'm not saying that there there may not be traumas and breaches and things you may have gone through, and I get it, but don't be content to stay there. Don't settle there. There's help out there for you. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says this, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree, both 
agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time. Somebody repeat that. Okay, good. So you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. And I love this. Because when you're depriving each other for a limited time, is it because you're in prayer? Probably not. (laughs) Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay, let's just let the Holy Spirit like punctuate that point. I don't even need to. Okay, men, don't just be motivated in your career. Be motivated to create romantic atmosphere for you, you and your spouse to enjoy. See, I found that a lot of men could just, should just say, well, she needs, to, she needs to make love to me three times a week just, just because it's her wifely duty. And I got a ton of Bible scriptures that, that support that. And I will pull them out when necessary and preach them. But you know what? There's a whole book devoted to sexual intimacy and romance in the Bible. It's called the Song of Solomon. Do you know what you won't find in Song of Solomon? Quotas. It never says, thou shalt have sex three times a week. It doesn't. Do you know what it does do? It talks about an intimate uh, environment and atmosphere that is created in order for romance and intimacy to flourish. Hey, you want to make it feel like a chore for your wife? Then reduce it down to a box she needs to tick. It will feel like a chore at the end of the day. If you're all beast mode and bad, A, and then all of a sudden you're like, woman, I know my rights. (laughs) Just, just, Just let me tell you, no woman wants to sleep with a jerk. That is probably the the greatest anti-aphrodisiac of all time. Okay, ladies, you ready for some? Ladies. Put the same level of energy into actually having the romance for your husband you pretend you have on Instagram. Oh, we're so good at those heartfelt posts. Oh, and he's my dream guy and I just stare at him all day and he takes my breath away. And then meanwhile, behind the scenes, in the real world, your bed is full of toddlers. You You got a whole bunch of babies in there. All your babies are in bed with you. (laughs) And you haven't had sex with him for months because you're breastfeeding way longer than is appropriate. (laughs) And it's awkward. Stop. People are talking about you behind your back. (laughs) And he's been relegated to the couch because you're mommy, but you've forgotten that you're also wife. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem. That's why I'm bringing it up. I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. Co-sleeping. Somebody needs to address the elephant in the room called co-sleeping. Where you've got babies till they're like four and five in bed with you, and literally you're using that as an escape hatch to not have intimate time with your husband, and it's damaging your relationship. It's causing a wedge and it's putting unnecessary pressure on him. Okay, the Bible says that what God, who God has brought together, let no toddler separate. (laughs) Baby will survive in baby's own bed. Get him one of those cute little cribs. If you need to put it in the walk-in wardrobe so you can hear their every little squeak and cough and sneeze, then so be it. But that bed is a sacred place. It's important. Please understand what I'm telling you today. You've got to keep that passion alive. Get that baby out of your bed. <laughs> Point number seven. Be affectionate. And I'm not just talking about sex here. I'm talking about affection. I'm talking about warmth. I'm talking about hand-holding. I'm talking about hugging. I'm talking about putting your hand on his knee. I'm talking about stroking the back of his neck. I'm talking about you... Uh, grabbing her arm and stroking it while she's watching television, all those little things. Do you know in Japan right now, there is a phenomena called the cuddle shop? Do you know why? Because they've got such a culture of coldness and no public public displays of affection that they've got to employ people to cuddle them. This is a problem. (laughs) This is a problem. Cuddle should be free. 
and they should be given by your significant others at any given time. And there's nothing too wrong with appropriate displays of, of affection in public. And, and you might think, well, the kids don't know. The kids, listen, the kids, the kids don't, they're going to say, ew, gross. Oh, my gosh, mom. Oh, my gosh, dad. Okay, they're going to do that. But deep down inside at a place they don't like to talk about at parties, they want to see you display affection. Nay, they need to see you display affection. You know, I used to be embarrassed because my mum and dad would always cuddle and whisper and kiss each other's cheek and then she'd sit on his knee and I'd think, oh, gross. But deep down I was like, well, my parents love each other. And now I do it to my husband. And my kids think it's a little bit gross, but you know what? They're going to carry on the tradition. Be affectionate. We don't need a cuddle shop. What I found is if you don't touch the people you should, you'll touch the people you shouldn't. If you don't touch people in a healthy way, you will touch them in an unhealthy way. Hashtag boom. (laughs) Point number eight. And I'm going to ask the band to come as we come to a close. And just so you know, we're going to have some time for prayer. And look, I'm not trying to brutalize people or or cause fights. But what I want to do is I do want to agitate you enough to do something about it. Because God wants to reset your marriage. And you don't need to leave it. You can reset your marriage with the person you're with today. Things can be better than they've been. You can have your own stund null. You can have your own zero hour. Point number eight. Leave the past in the past. In Philippians 3.13, I love this scripture. Dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. My friends, if you want a marriage that you can look forward to, you have to forget about the past. You know, even in this story, as I was watching them come together there at the end, I kept thinking, you know, they're going to need really good forgetteries. There's a whole lot of things that they're going to have to choose to forget. Well, I keep remembering it. Well, listen, sometimes forgetting is a choice. Oh, I forgot about that, said no one ever. You will rehearse it over and over and over again unless you make a decision to do what the Bible says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is virtuous. If there is anything praiseworthy, think on these things. It's amazing how the devil will try to lure us into the past. We've got the door open. We'll come back here. Look at what I found in 1994. You wait till you get back here with me. Oh, it's juicy. It's going to make you so mad. I know it happened 25 years ago, but you're going to feel as mad today as you did then. And you walk through. And like me, you find that photo that I found a couple of years ago of Jürgen's car. And initially I was like, oh, Jürgen and his old car that I met him in. And I was like, hang on a minute. That's the car where he made me sit in the back seat while his surfboard got the front seat. My husband's a chauvinist. And I started getting mad furious and stomping and huffing and puffing and he came home oblivious hey babe I'm like you forget about the past press forward to the goal what's the goal the goal is reconciliation the goal is a reset you're gonna have to forget about some stuff and here's the truth he can't go back to 1994 and change it I bet he wish wishes he could, if only, but he can't. So that means I'm going to have to just do a really good job at forgetting. Forget about the past. It's time to move forward. If you want to reset, shut the door on yesterday. Point number nine, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Most marriages end not because of one big cataclysmic fight, but just a lot of little fights that aren't dealt with. And then it just comes down to two of you in a courthouse citing irreconcilable differences. You know, the Bible's really smart when it tells us that we should be mindful of the time frame of appropriate anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. What does that tell me? You're allowed to be angry. There's stuff in life that is going to make you angry, but you get a day. God's like, I'm going to give you a day to kick the wall, cuss a little bit, be mad, go spend a lot of money. But when you see that sun going down, 
that is literally your signal to say, all right, it's time to take care of business now. Lord, I choose to forgive. I choose to have that conversation. I choose to leave it at the foot of the cross. I'm not going to let the sun go down on my anger. I'm not going to go to bed mad. And I'm going to make a decision that I'm not going to go to bed alone. See, you know, there's a blight and this is happening in a lot of places around the world. Husbands and wives sleeping in different rooms. Don't do it. Bible says, and the two will become one flesh. The devil can do, wants to do whatever he can to separate, to divide you so he can conquer. You're meant to be together. This is meant to be. And this is your God-ordained season for a reset. Get out of the spare room and back in the bedroom. And husbands or wives, you welcome them. You don't say, well, you better come. Because what I found, is if you don't deal with it before the sun goes down, you wake up angry. You wake up disenfranchised from one another. From one another. You wake up and instead of enjoying a cup of coffee together and cuddles and snuggles, you walk in with that coffee and you're like, swirling it like a witch's brew. <laughs> don't do it. Forget about it. Let it go. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And the Bible tells us, not to let the sun go down on our anger because otherwise we will give the devil a foothold. If you want to reset, you got to shut the door on the devil and stop giving him so many gosh darn opportunities to come in and mess with what is so precious to you. Don't let the sun go down. Oh gosh, Jürgen and I, and I'm out of time, but <sighs> how many years? 12 years ago, we had marriage counseling. Our son had been through a real trying season and so I find that if you don't come together in those moments you'll tear each other apart so we were arguing and fighting there was a lot of stress so we went and we got outside council and we sat down and I mean it was amazing we had like a decade of offenses against each other that we hadn't dealt with I mean we had not only let one son go down on our anger, we'd let like a million sons go down on our anger. And as a result, we had all this pent up, all this stuff coming. I remember walking out of the building after we said everything we needed to say and the lady counseled us and gave us just the most excellent wisdom. And we just looked at each other and laughed like, oh my gosh, can you believe all that was in there? But you know, so many people are dealing with stuff like but 10 x of what Jürgen and I went through because they're constantly letting the sun go down on their wrath. They're not dealing with things and they're bitter and they're twisted and they don't like each other and they're nursing a grudge. The Bible is, is right. The Bible is smart. And we're smart people when we do what it says. And finally, patiently put up with each other. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says this. Always be humble and gentle patiently put up with each other and love each other. Why should we put up with each other? Well, the short answer is it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, sometimes I think the one thing that needs to change in our marriage is the fact that we need to have the understanding or the realisation that there are some things that will never change. And I'm not talking about the big stuff, but I'm talking about the little things. He may always be persnickety with his food. She may always be a little bit obsessive with the house cleaning. He may always be a little bit more blunt than you'd like. She may always spend a little bit more money than you'd like. But sometimes you just need to go, you know what, I'm going to patiently bear with you because it's worth it. Marriage, an awesome marriage, is not made up of two perfect people. It's made up of two patiently committed people. When you've got two people who are patiently committed, you can overcome every obstacle. Today, my friends, today, God wants to give you a reset. You've got a reset button today. You don't need to start anew with someone else. You can start over with the one you're with. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Let us not be a church of statistics where the same 70% divorce rate out there is the same 70% divorce rate in here. Things could be, should be different in God's house. Do you know why? Because here we're going to tell you the truth and we're going to help you live life God's way. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our pastors, team, and what we do at C3 San Diego, go to C3SanDiego.com.